mid-July, family visiting the 37 hectares, 91 acres, of the Greener Moor Nature Reserve. This lies in the northeast of the county. The area protects Cornwall's last remaining substantial tract of a very special kind of habitat called Culm grassland. Most of this was ploughed up and drained in a mass orgy of destruction that took place in the 1970s and 80s. The undisturbed Culm grassland lies above a geological formation giving rise to heavy waterlogged soils. There are two key plant indicators for this type of habitat. One of these is seen here, the world caraway. The second indicator is the meadow thistle. By the time that I arrived, the majority of these had already finished flowering. Thousands of fluffy white seed heads were now waving in the wind. The few plants that were still in flower were popular with a healthy population of marbled white butterflies. Within Cornwall, this has rather a scattered distribution, mainly in the east of the county. If you see a marbled white, the chances are it will be visiting a pink flowered plant, such as a thistle or knapweed. For example, it seldom seems to pay a visit to the yellow flowers of the marsh ragwort. On the way up to the moor, the lanes were bordered by masses of white flowered meadow sweet. I was heading up onto Bobby Moor in order to film the dainty blue flowers of the ivy leaf bellflower. Up here, this is pretty common, especially in damp places and beside streams. While I was filming the flowers, this golden ring dragonfly turned up. This is a typical species of these fast flowing upland streams. Back home, I regularly pop over onto Bobmin Beacon to see how things are developing. By mid-July, a substantial population of sawwort is guaranteed to be in flower. Like its close relatives, the thistles and netweeds, sawwort is heavily visited by a wide variety of insects. Top left there's a drone fly, and top right is a bumblebee. These two are residents here. By contrast, this clouded yellow butterfly is a recent immigrant. In a good year, thousands of these will make the long trip up from their breeding grounds in North Africa and the Mediterranean area. Being mainly coastal, Cornwall is one of the best counties for seeing this butterfly, especially in a poor year when relatively few arrive. Although it's currently expanding its range within Britain, the Cornish woodlands have long been a major stronghold for the silver wash fritillary butterfly. Within the last few years, this butterfly has been found in more than 500 one kilometre squares within the county. Most of these represent breeding populations. In many localities, it's common to see a male chasing a female, especially along a path. As she flies along straight and level, the male loops around her, sharing her with love dust. While filming the fertilities, I spotted a silken web full of bright orange caterpillars. These belong to the hawthorn moth, a rare species in Cornwall, apparently with only five previous records. These were actually feeding on hawthorn but they're also found on blackthorn and plum. Note the silken thread trailing from the mouth of the lowermost caterpillar as it extends the web. With the coast being so near, I just can't stay away for long. Here, the perennial south is a typical plant of field borders. For some unknown reason, in Cornwall, 
The musk thistle is far more common near the coast than it is inland, where it's becoming rarer and rarer. The large, attractive, plump pink flower heads are heavily visited by bees. Unlike some, the buff tailed bumblebee is still a common species throughout Britain. On the cliff tops, the wind is a constant companion. It can make life difficult both for filmmakers and for foraging meadow pipits. This juvenile stone chat had found rather a more sheltered position. It was completely unfazed by my presence. The adult mayor was rather less happy about seeing me there. The great willow herb avoids the wind-blasted cliffs. It prefers damp hollows among the sand dunes and in groves of alders. Lush, marshy places are also a preferred habitat for the large tiger hoverfly. This is a female. She gets much larger than the males. In Britain generally, this is rather a scarce and scattered species. In Cornwall it's fairly common, with records for nearly 200 one kilometre squares. Although usually occurring singly, I've sometimes found dozens together. While it's satisfying to portray the beauty of individual insects or spiders, what I really enjoy is portraying life histories. So now let's take a closer look at the domestic arrangements of the mother care spider. Its rather scrappy, flimsy webs are particularly common on gorse. Although looking rather haphazard in its design, this scaffolding type of web is actually quite efficient at knocking down and trapping flying insects. As she goes about the business of actually constructing her web, the female certainly seems to know what she's doing. Despite its complicated three-dimensional structure, she does seem to know exactly where to put each thread. Incidentally, her body is only about one-third the size of the average frozen pea. As its name suggests, the mother care spider is one of the few species which actually interact with their offspring. In 1926, it was noted that the newly hatched babies take their first meal regurgitated from their mother's mouth. As far as the babies are concerned, this is a habit that they wish to continue for as long as possible. So they spend a lot of their time constantly badgering their mother to cough up an endless supply of new meals. Here this seems to have worked as they're clustered around her mouth parts. Sad to say though, most of the time their constant pestering seems to be in vain. In fact the females just seem to spend a lot of their time desperately trying to escape from the insistent attentions of their offspring. As they continue to grow, the babies start to take solid food in the form of insects trapped in the web. The babies only have tiny and rather weak mouth parts. They just can't cope with hard-bodied insects, even small ones. So their mother pre-prepares the baby food by giving it a thorough chewing. This softens it up and starts the juices flowing. With a meal so tantalisingly close, the babies find it really difficult to wait. They keep on trying to dart in and take a bite. 
but the female always wants to finish the job and vibrates her body to shoo them away. She'll also use her legs to repel her more adventurous offspring. At last her brood is allowed to cluster around their meal. But then the female suddenly decides to move the meal, complete with babies, by towing it to another part of the web. But she soon relented and then spent some time sharing the meal with her offspring. Then she left them to get on with it by themselves. Mother care spider families can be quite large. Here we can see at least 40 babies busy feeding on a beetle. The body of each baby is actually smaller than a steel pinhead, not those big blobby plastic ones which are much bigger. Their mother has now retired into her domed retreat, incorporating numerous gorse pods and she's left them to it. In another family, the female seems to have lost a substantial part of her brood. She has joined the remainder in feasting on quite a sizeable meal, an earwig. In view of an earwig's tough body, the female must have devoted quite a bit of time preparing it so that her babies could tackle it with their tiny jaws. The ponds on the Breeny Common Reserve are so fascinating that I just can't stay away for long. By late July, suddenly there are emerald damselflies everywhere. This is a male with his typical blue eyes. In the females, the eyes are brown. This one has caught a small beetle. Using her spiny front legs as a kind of cage, she swept it up in flight. Now it's being thoroughly dismembered. Emerald damselflies can spend up to an hour when mating in the so-called wheel position. As with a number of other damselflies, the male retains his grip on the female's head as she prepares to lay her eggs. She seems to find this stem unsuitable, so they fly to another to try that. This time, the hollow stem of the horsetail seems to win the female's approval. She starts to insert her eggs into the cavity within the stem. As she continues to work away, the female gradually begins to approach the surface of the water. But then, instead of stopping, as in most damselflies, they continue downwards into the depths below. Using air trapped on the wings and body, they can spend as much as half an hour submerged. This is quite risky behaviour as they're quite vulnerable to predators such as fish, newts or water boatmen. Pond skaters are another potential threat, although less so than the voracious water boatman with its really painful bite. Even the plants can be predators. This bladder work catches tiny aquatic life in miniature underwater traps. The edges of the ponds are humming with bumblebees visiting the wood sage flowers.
In Cornwall, the dark green fritillary butterfly is mainly coastal, but it does occur on some of the inland heaths, as here at Breeny. As with many butterflies, a female dark green fritillary seldom gets to feed peacefully for very long. She's soon interrupted by one or more pushy male suitors. These two will be sharing her with pheromone-rich love dust from their wings. Napweed flower heads present rich pickings for quite a range of insects, not just butterflies. Although this might resemble a wasp, it is in fact a large female specimen of the bog hoverfly. It rocks its head from side to side as it grooms its large bulbous eyes with its front legs. This is one of our bigger and more impressive hoverflies. Just compare it with the marmalade hoverfly that briefly turns up. Watch how it comes back a second time to see if the flower has become vacant. Cone-headed flies are rarely seen on that weed or anywhere else. The females perform the rather hazardous task of attaching an egg to the body of a living bumblebee as it visits flowers. Meanwhile, in the nearby damp, lush, flowery areas, there's plenty of courtship chasing going on amongst the small skipper butterflies. The paths meandering through the trees at Breeny are as good a place as any to see a hovering male of Volucella pellucens, otherwise known as the pellucid hoverfly. He spends most of his day hovering like this in a sunspot, waiting for a female who's looking for a mate. Spending hours each day in constant flight consumes a lot of energy. So the males have to devote part of each day to stocking up on fuel in the form of nectar from flowers. One of the richest sources of nectar, and most easily accessible, is bramble flowers. And these are great favourites with these hoverflies. These males will have spent their larval stages inside one of the most dangerous places you could imagine, a wasp's nest. But the larva will have developed from an egg that the female somehow has to get into the nest. How does she do it? We're not sure. What we do know is that this female seems able to walk straight into the nest without being apprehended and torn apart by the nest's owners. There's only one entrance and this is it. To get past the WASP version of passport control you have to have the correct visa. This takes the form of a specific scent special to this nest and this nest alone. If an intruder even a wasp of this species, but from a different nest, tries to make an entrance, it will be attacked and killed. But the female hoverfly bears the scent of a nest that was active in the previous year. She's never encountered this nest and therefore cannot possibly bear its scent. And yet female hoverflies have been seen walking boldly straight into the nests, even being bumped into by wasps on the way out. I can't help wondering if this female, quietly feeding on burdock flowers, has actually been inside a nest already, or is yet to take up the challenge. The female pellucid hoverfly is not the only one that has to run the gauntlet of a nest full of dangerous defenders. 
bent on destroying any intruder. The female of our largest and most impressive species, the hornet hoverfly, also has to embark on that same hazardous venture. This used to be quite a rarity in Britain, but it's now far more widespread across the south of the country. I find it every year in my garden, as seen here. When in flight, it really does resemble a hornet. This is particularly so when it's next to a pellucid hoverfly. Late July is time for the third of our common brown butterflies, the gatekeeper, to make its appearance on the scene. It's smaller than its predecessors, the meadow brown and ringlet, but far more attractive. This is because it has far more orange, both on the upper side and underside of its wings. For a while you can see all three species together, but then the ringlet gradually starts to fade out from the scene and disappears. Yet the meadow brown, even though it was the first to appear as early as the middle of May, can still be found flying around. And not just old tattered specimens either, but fresh new ones. This is because the meadow brown has a very protracted egg laying season. And much like this gatekeeper, the meadow brown is common in my garden flowers. And it's about now that adult peacock butterflies begin to put in a brief appearance before going into an early hibernation. The red admirals have been here more or less continuously since early springtime and they'll linger on until well into the autumn. They'll be the last butterflies to be seen in fact. Or perhaps that should apply more aptly to the speckled wood which also has an extremely long season. It's about now that I start searching the birch leaves up on Bobmin Beacon for any signs of parent bug families. These fully grown nymphs have spent their entire lives, up until now, as a group, for reasons I'll explain shortly. Just listen to that goldfinch up above me. There it is. I'd previously noticed that the parent bug families quite often change their leaf. And by the way, here you can see the birch catkins, which is what they mainly feed on. After checking the situation several times during the afternoon, about 4.30 things finally started to happen. The big move had finally begun. I'm not sure if one particular bug always acts as leader or whether this is swapped day by day. What I do know is that they checked out several leagues before they finally selected one they liked. Now, as promised, let's take a look at an earlier stage in the parent bug family's life. For this I'm having to use a still picture. This shows a group of half-grown nymphs with their mother standing guard over them. She's done this since she laid her eggs, which she also guards. When they finally get big enough to fend for themselves, she dies. A small patch of stinging nettles in the tiny wild part at the bottom of my garden also gave me an insight into the family life of true bugs. These are the seeds of the stinging nettle and they're the primary food for the nettle ground bug which we see here feeding on them. There was certainly more than one family here forming a seething mass of bugs. Unlike the parent bug nymphs which were all of the same age, these are in all stages of development from tiny almost newly hatched nymphs 
to adults. Unlike in the parent bird, the females actually never see their offspring. Although it's interesting, my small garden does provide rather limited opportunities for wildlife watching, so I tend to cross the road over to the beacon as much as possible. By late July, any walk through the more wooded rides on the beacon are sure to turn up two or three male southern hawker dragonflies. At this stage of their lives, they spend their time well away from the water in which they developed as nymphs. I can tell that this one has spotted me. It started to vibrate its wings. It's too cold to fly off immediately, so this vibration is designed to warm up the wing muscles, enabling flight to commence. It's about now that I start to examine clumps of hedge woundwort flowers for signs of wool carder bees. There's a male, patrolling his territory. Unlike in most bees, he's bigger than the females. And he needs to be big and tough. He's running a protection racket, food for sex. He needs to be big and tough in order to drive away any other different kinds of insects visiting his flowers. He's fearless. He'll even violently ram bumblebees twice his size. In return for access to this valuable protected resource, the females have to pay a price, sex, and as many times a day as the male wants it. This means that males get to mate as many as a dozen times a day, while an individual female may have to submit as many as three times in a single morning. And just remember that in most bees, the females mate just once in their entire lives. Mating only takes about 10 seconds, then the female resumes going about her business as if nothing had happened. Females line their nests with flocked, scraped off hairy leaved plants such as this hedge woundwort. Unfortunately, I never actually saw this happen here. All was not lost though. In my garden I was deliberately cultivating a much hairier and more attractive plant. Lamb's ear. Just compare it for hairiness with the hedge woundwort in my hand. It's not surprising then that when available, lamb's ear provides top choice for the females. With such a superabundance of hairs, the females can gather a really big ball of fluff in really quick time. Sometimes they'll fly off with a load almost as big as their own body. There she goes. It's hard work and sometimes a brief pause is needed to groom the body before starting on the next job. Using them as shears, her powerful jaws make short work of snipping off the hairs. Her final task is to shape her cargo into a neat ball before flying off back to the nest.